Thank you all for joining us. I'm Erin, um, right here. <laughs> um, I will be running the webinar today. We'll get started in just a moment. Um, everyone joining us remote is actually on mute. So if you do have questions, please type those in in the question function, and we will get to those as soon as possible. I will be reading those off. Um, so I am Sydney Guyon, a Deputy <coughs> Attorney General of the Idaho Attorney General's Office in the Consumer Protection Division. And here with me today is um, the Division Chief of the Consumer Protection Division, uh, also the Deputy Attorney General. Um, and we are here to talk about the new well, proposed legislation that we have drafted. Um, which is called the Idaho Charitable Assets Protection Act, and we have shortened that to ICAPA, which is it's very catchy. <laughs> so, um, welcome everybody today, and um, thanks to me for so helpful to everybody. So, um, I, I thought I would just go through a little bit what the Attorney General's Office does, um, just basically, so people understand um, no, is um, Lawrence Watson. There are um, six, six divisions with the uh, Attorney General's Office, um, criminal, civil, natural resources, consumer protection, um, contracts, and health and human services. And all of those divisions do different things, enforce different laws, um, represent agencies, or rep just represent the state of Idaho in general. Consumer protection actually represents um, the Department of Finance and the Department of Insurance. And then we have three attorneys that do consumer protection, that enforce the consumer protection related laws. And by far, the, the Idaho Consumer Protection Act and trade and commerce. But we also enforce prohibits septic telephone solicitations, all those things that we love to get it. 5 o'clock at night, um, and the Competition Act, and a variety of smaller statutes that are scattered throughout the Idaho Code. The one that we're going to talk about today in relationship to this new legislation is the Idaho Charitable Solicitation Act, and it, um, in general, prohibits um, unfair, deceptive, misleading acts or practices um, while soliciting charitable donations or charitable contributions. And um, that that act we have tried to incorporate into ICAPA. And the reason for that is to to streamline more of our streamline more of our statutes, keeping the major laws that our office enforces concerning the charitable organizations, putting it all into one place. There are other um, charitable organization related statutes that we enforce also. The, uh, I'll just briefly touch on those. The I don't, um, oh, can we click to the next screen? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. No worries. Here we go. Um, the Idaho Nonprofit Hospital Conversion Act covers um, conversions from nonprofit hospital to a for-profit hospital. Our office has to review all of those conversions and sign off on them to make sure that the charitable assets of the nonprofit hospital are protected and preserved. Then the Idaho Code 67. 14015 um, is our primary duty statute, so to speak, for overseeing charitable um, charitable trust assets. And it's been around since 1963 and has um, given has been the source of our authority when we pursue an investigation or an action against a charitable organization that holds um, charitable assets and has either diverted, allegedly, diverted them or um, abused the assets or misappropriated them in some way. 
um, Idaho Code um, 68.1204 is another one of those small statutes that covers charitable trust and its primary purpose is it's a notice statute and there are quite a few notice statutes in the Idaho Code that require giving the Attorney General an opportunity to be heard and object or sign off on termination of charitable trusts. And Idaho Code 68204 is the termination statute. If a trustee wants to terminate a trust, he needs to notify our office so that we can um, review the transaction and make sure that the charitable assets, again, are protected and preserved. The Idaho Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which um, is also known as the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, is at uh, Title 33, Chapter 50, Idaho Code. And most of that law, we don't have anything to do with, we don't enforce it, but there is one provision in there that talks about uh, a release or modification of a restriction on a, a charitable gift. And that is, that is where notice has to be provided to our office again um, so, that we, so that we have an opportunity to object or um, intervene to protect and preserve the assets. And finally, there are some trust administration statutes that are scattered here and there. Um, 1574024 covers um, terminations of small trusts, ones that are under $100,000. <coughs> and we, as the, the Attorney General's Office, as an interested party, uh, needs to get notice of those terminations so that once again we have the opportunity to intervene or object um, generally however we, we sign up on those because the trustee um, is is um, protecting those assets making sure that they go to the the correct entity um, the beneficiary um, and then there is just Title 15, Chapter 8, which um, covers trust and estates in general um, and has what's called tethered to the Trust and Estates Dispute Resolution Act, which allows interested parties to um, get together and resolve the differences on, on the trust. And our participation in that once again this is responsible as a um, interested party and we can object, we can intervene, which we've done before if we think that there is um, something unlawful going on with the assets. So those those are the primary um, charitable trust and charitable solicitation laws that we enforce and that we are facing our new uh, statute on. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Our enforcement process is pretty um, free basic and it's what we want to incorporate into the new law, into ICAVA. First, we receive a notice, so a complaint or a letter or we read something in the newspaper about an action and activity, a practice that's going on out in the community that may be a violation of laws that we enforce. That's when we review the allegations, we review the situation, we conduct our investigation, and decide is there is there a, a reasonable suspicion that um, a violation occurred? If so, we will proceed with one of our resolution options, or if that's not possible, settlement is not possible, then we will proceed with court. 
Um, you want to go to the next slide? If anybody has any questions in the room and wants to interject about something or a comment, even, let me know. All of you have a lot of knowledge too about this stuff. Just to touch on some of the enforcement actions that have once again led to why we think um, ICAPA is important. Um, the first one involved in the state of a lady that left a holographic will and she attempted to leave all of her assets to the dogs of Idaho. This is like a perfect law exam. Yeah. And, and this is your perfect law exam uh, scenario of facts of here's the facts and analyze the situation. Um, the, the holographic rule was actually just written on piece of paper in her own handwriting and signed by her um, saying, I want my brother to get nothing and I want all of my property to go to to help the dogs of Idaho. What do you do with that? Well, the brother, of course, got notice of um, the will being um, undergoing, it's undergoing probate or whatever it is they do with those. Um, they do probate. They put pro okay. See, I had to do that in law school. <laughs> and um, he got noticed because he was um, an interested heir. And he decided that, you know, all of her money should go to him. And she had some some land in Windsor that was worth a little bit, and plus she had um, saved her money. So there was a substantial amount of money that was in dispute. So we, along with um, a law firm in Windsor, um, went into that case to protect <laughs> to protect the charitable gift that she had left. With dogs of Idaho. And in our interpretation, that device was specific enough um, to constitute a, a charitable trust. And um, the court could look at that and say, dogs of Idaho, okay. There's the Humane Society. There are various other um, humane organizations that take care of animals. I think we can um, carry out her intent and um, distribute the funds and ultimately after a court action and a number of hearings that's what occurred we got final decisions from the court upholding the will and um, distributing the funds to the Idaho Community Society here in Boston and we presented them with a check uh, two Christmases ago, and um, it all turned out quite well. Um, the next case, the Idaho Aquarium, that's a more recent case um, involving misappropriation of charitable assets and involved the Idaho Aquarium that's over on Cole and Franklin. I don't know if anybody's ever been, been there. Um, they had executives in charge that didn't have a whole lot of business sense about them and were using the assets. Donations and everything else that came in um, were using those for personal purposes to buy them stuff, um, to buy gas and food and um, go on trips and buy gifts for their, their family. Um, and we determined that there was definite misappropriation of charitable assets. By that point, the Idaho Aquarium had, was pretty much broke, um, but it still wanted to continue on. So in our opinion, it was, it was better for us to 
work with them to change their practices, change the board's practices to get them up and running more um, effectively and within the bounds of the law, um, rather than going to court and litigating the matter and possibly shutting down the aquarium, which would have been really tragic because they have a lot of animals over there that they would have had to rehome. Um, and ultimately, the executives ended up in federal prison on separate charges. So, <laughs> um, being a memorial hospital, the hospital over in Blackfoot, it is a nonprofit hospital. And again, there were a couple executives that used charitable assets, used funds belonging to the hospital to fund a, a private venture in Saipan. Um, and to pay for a lot of really expensive meals, if, if you can imagine expensive meals in Blackfoot or Eastern Idaho, <laughs> but to that area, there's the sandpiper over there, and that seems to be their go-to place for um, spending a few hundred dollars on lunch um, or cocktails. I don't know. <laughs> Just bringing it along, but um, so once again, we worked with the board, setting up some new or best practices for them to follow, and um, they reimbursed our office for our fees and costs, and it's now um, those executives are no longer with the hospital, and it's it seems to be progressing a lot better, <laughs> shall we say. Um, Soldier Mountain, that is a ski hill over in Fairfield, and it it's was a nonprofit, and it wanted to become a for-profit, sell it to a private owner, because as a nonprofit, it just wasn't making it. It's a very small establishments and um, with the lack of snow in the last few years, it just wasn't bringing in the revenue that it needed. So they found a couple of buyers by advertising the entity on Facebook and it was kind of a, a bidding war and they ended up at a certain price that was not substantially below the value of the hill, but less than the value of the hill. And they didn't bother getting an appraisal for determining the actual fair market value of what they were um, selling and the fact that they were selling it to a for-profit instead of a non-profit, that raised some issues with our office. Um, so we ended up getting an appraiser Fraser went in and did a very, very thorough review of the property and found that what was going to be paid was insufficient. So the way we worked it out was um, the new owners of the now for-profit entity have to provide a certain amount of services, goods and services related to skiing to um, children and the elderly and seniors, um, uh, veterans um, and other populations provide free services to them, allowing ski passes or free ski rentals um, to make up for that that lost amount of money that they didn't get from the sale. <clears throat> and finally, um, Quinn Falls YMCA was our most recent case. Um, it, it was in the paper a lot and involved once again an executive that didn't know how to budget and he ended up using all of the the donated funds that were set aside for special projects um, used all of that money to just operate the entity. Um, 
to keep it going. And when um, the donors found out that their donations were not used appropriately, then obviously that was um, a concern of ours and a concern of theirs. Um, but it's not as if the executive used those funds for private purposes. The, the money still went to the organization. So we, um, once again, we offered some recommendations to the board to change their, their practices, and they are trying to get back on their feet, and that executive is, is no longer with, with the YMCA. I'll interrupt just because I think these are these are recent examples in our office, but they give you a fairly good um, survey of the sort of issues that we see. The, the Tibbetts case and the YMCA case are, are instances where we felt like we had an obligation to protect the donor's intent um, with respect to charitable trust assets. That, that when someone wants to donate to a charitable trust, that, that intent needs to be uh, upheld and it, it needs to be uh, it ensured that the intent is carried out. The Otto Quarum and Bingham cases are instances where you have people who are taking charitable trust assets and essentially converting them to personal uh, private use uh, in both instances. And Soldier Mountain is a separate example of when you have current charitable trust assets that are going to convert into a for-profit sort of um, operation, um, the value of those assets needs to continue on. They, they don't just in to the benefit of the private owner. After we did the appraisals in Soldier Mountain, we found out that there was, yeah, we took out all the, the loans. There's probably about 15, I can't remember, it was 15, 13,000, oh, about $15,000 of total trust equity, if you will, that that's where we negotiate. So, well, let's take that 15,000 and you can do things that fifteen thousand dollars worth of benefit to the community that furthers those charitable trust intent. So that, that's a good it's a good snapshot though of the sort of issues that we do. Now these don't count our charitable solicitation cases that are just more deceptive solicitations. But these are more of the a good snapshot of the sort of issues we deal with with respect to charitable trust assets in our state. Um, we had about, well, four or five cases involving deceptive solicitations, and it seems like we're always investigating something involving donations or an issue involving charitable trust assets. It's not necessarily something that will, will turn into uh, a court action or an intervention or even recommendations to the board, but we are getting more and more of these cases, these same types of cases, um, and that's a big reason for introducing this new legislation is to help clarify what the Attorney General's office has for authority in this area and to help us, help give us more investigative tools. These cases have helped us see where we think you know, it's really not that clear. Or maybe the legislature should be the ones to set down the rules instead of see what a judge will do or not do, or what the attorney general thinks or persuades. And let's, why don't we just lay it out on the table and say, legislature, you decide what the ground rules are, and then everyone will know. And, and then they can plan accordingly because, you know, we, there's, there's areas where it's like, I don't know, you know, it's not clear, or I'm not sure we can do something about it, which to us seems like a problem that we want to remedy. So, so part of the reason for the legislation is to say, let's let's let the legislature set the policy for the state with respect to how to deal with some of these charitable trust asset issues that, that we're seeing happen, and, um, and then everyone knows and they can plan accordingly. If you're an attorney, you can advise your client. Here's what the law says. Here's what you need to do or not do. Or or if you're advising a, a board. Here's what you better do. Here's your standard you got to conform to, or, 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 or here's what you got to do with your executive. You know, whatever it might be. Um, so we, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not I don't want to take away from what Stephanie, Stephanie's done the work on this, and it's not a lot of it. But we, we end up looking at what other states have done, um, uh, looked at what 
interest groups out there have, have proposed, whether it's uniform law this and uniform law that, and then I see this probably would work for Idaho, or oh, this is too much, or, or you know, why don't we tweak it this way? Um, do, you, do you have a sponsor from Idaho, or do you need a sponsor? Um, we don't yet. Okay, so let's just sort of launch into the, the legislation. You want to move ahead one slide. Um, go over each section um, individually, the purpose definitions, charitable solicitations, charitable organizations, and enforcement, which each comprise um, a, a group of sections. Um, the next slide is discussing the purpose of the legislation and um, Brett kind of went over that. To we want to streamline all of these different laws that we have um, into one section that you can look at and know that there isn't something else out there that you maybe need to hunt for to see if you're you're complying. What what and I'm not care. One of the it was Stephanie's idea was a good one is. You know, we saw those different statutory sites, 68 this and 67. So why don't we put them all in one, one uh, chapter instead of having them all over the code? So some of this language will look very familiar because it's, it's just you took out language from this section of this chapter or this section in this chapter and put it in one spot with respect to the Attorney General and the Charitable Trust Assets. So, um, so most of this language is not new in the sense that it's, it's in the code somewhere. Now, some of it's been edited, and that for sure. Um, but you know, some of this language may look very familiar because it is. It's, it's already in the code. It's just being moved to, to one location. And there is, like I said before, there, there was always, a, there has been an issue with our, our general authority on what exactly can the Attorney General's Office do when it comes to charitable organizations? Um, are we limited to just the, the organization as a whole? Do we have any authority over the people that actually run the organization? And in the past, we have always taken the position that our, our authority um, ends with the organization. We don't, um, we don't have authority to go after the individual that has really caused the harm, um, as you can see from the, the cases that we discussed. And part of that is because of the Nonprofit Corporations Act, which in other states, the, um, the legislatures there have given the Attorney General authority under the Nonprofit Corporations Act to um, to handle those situations involving individuals, but in ours, um, we don't have that authority. We don't enforce the Nonprofit Corporations Act, um, and so we wanted to be sure in this new legislation to address um, what our authority would be over individuals, the actual wrongdoers, rather than just going after the organization. The current law, 67.1015, says the Attorney General has authority to supervise nonprofit corporate or well, any corporation of any charitable trust asset. Who knows what supervise means? And who wants to go to a court and let a court say, well, it could mean sitting on the board. You know, it could mean, who knows? It, it's, an, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult word, but that's the word. And we've always been uncomfortable saying, we, we should put some flesh to this some meat to this so that we have a little bit better idea um, um, of what in Idaho the Attorney General should or should not be doing and not just leave it to supervise. Um, it, it, what's supervised in my view is going to be very different from what it is in, in your view. So anyways. So if I read uh, the very last sentence on the bottom of the first page of the legislation, it says the Attorney General is the state of Idaho's chief legal officer is best positioned to ensure that charitable organizations 
utilize their charitable assets to further their charitable purpose. And I always did not take that well. I think the board of directors of the organization is the best position. And to me, to say the attorney general is best position um, to ensure the charitable organization is use their charitable assets. Um, was too strong for me. And I you know, ask people in the room if, if they think your board is best positioned or if they think the attorney general is best positioned. I'm guessing people would like to think the board is best positioned. And I would agree with that. Um, to use, how to use the charitable assets to further their charitable purpose, yes. Um, that's always up to the board. Um, the problem is, is that there's no one that's ensuring that they're used that way. Um, and I can, I can see how this is overbroad and needs to be fixed. But the idea is to, um, to have another level of uh, authority that is making sure that the instances involving these organizations that I talked about before, that there's someone that um, can ensure that that what the board <laughs> has done, um, which they don't always do, they don't always use their assets correctly, um, someone that can take action when that happens. But let us look, I, I think we're, when I read this, this is more of a screening issue. Um, when it comes to charitable trust assets, um, someone from the public doesn't have standing. If someone's using a charitable trust asset inappropriately, only the attorney general has standing under the common law. And, and so it's not so much the decision of how to use it, but to ensure that it is used appropriately, um, it takes the attorney general to, to correct that that misallocation. So, so maybe that's a, it's a wording issue as much to, to maybe uh, clear the, the best position. It's the best position legal officer. And that could be those two. No, that's, that's a good idea too. I, I, that, that, that's probably more accurate too. So. Okay. And I'll just make kind of like to know where I'm coming from. I agree with the concepts of the legislation. Um, depending on how much detail we get into today, I'll have a number of specific things that are concerning, and that's just an example of one. Um, that's helpful, though. And, you know, the word waste appears throughout you know, this very first um, 48-12-102, and to me, waste is kind of micromanaging I can probably pick any organization in the world and say they are 100% efficient. And, um, the, I saw misuse, misappropriation, misappropriate words, but waste to me was something I just looked at. Okay. Okay, we do have a comment from um, John Rushi, who's joining us remotely. Um, as far as sponsorship, it might be good to talk about the politics. There's a fair amount of antipathy towards the AG on the part of the House Republicans, and his opposition to HJR5 will not help. I'm going to that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, who was the comment? Comment? Oh, it's Representative Rushi. Um, well, hello. <laughs> um, we 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 just haven't gotten to the, the sponsorship stage. Um, what we've done over the last year is we've been providing drafts to interested parties um, to try to really get their feedback so that we could go to the legislature, hopefully, and say we've really worked with the stakeholders and we've taken to part their comments. This this version we have today is probably the fifth version because we have lots of edits already from people saying this or that and they've been really helpful. Um, and so when we come to the legislature, 
our goal still is to say we've worked with the stakeholders and and um, we've listened to their input, we've incorporated it, and, and we think we're pretty much all on the same page. Now maybe we won't get there, but that's the goal, is to say we're all on the same page, this will be good for the state. Um, then we can go to um, the legislature and um, present the bill and, and work it on the political side of the council. I just want to interject so to that and at the end of this meeting, let's circle back as a group and just decide what some additional actions that might be and maybe there may be some further sure. committee or some oh, that, We anticipate there's going to be more. Um, this is not a final take or leave it. This is, we're at the stage where we, we, you know, we want to hear more. Um, we don't have to make, you know, we can work this month, next month, and we got time. Um, well, no. Good. Because we, we really would like you, you know, the goal is to the legislature say, this is how it's supposed to be. We, we learned a lot from our stakeholders. They gave a lot of good input. We think they're supportive of it now. Um, and we certainly are. And, and then hopefully we can persuade the legislature then to go forward with it. Now this, this certainly is not perfect, and every time I look at it, I, I make notes about, oh, I need to talk to Brett about this, and I need to talk to Brett about that, because this doesn't sound right, or we need to include this or take this out, so um, we are constantly revising this. Um, so any input you can get from people who are have an interest in this area is greatly appreciated. I don't want to go off too much track, but I think what fired this bill is when we went to the Attorney General, there's a couple of things. First of all, things are scattered, and that's hard for lawyers and, and, and charitable groups. Why don't we consolidate it? Another thing is, who knows what supervisory means? And that uncertainty is a difficult thing to work through. Third is, there are weaknesses in, in the current state law. We can't go after the Idaho Aquarium people who use charitable trust assets to buy themselves payment trusts. We should be able to, or someone should. If it's not the Attorney General, someone else should. Because they ought not to be able to make off with the money and, and call it good. Um, the fourth uh, area is some of these assets can get substantial, like Soldier Mountain. Maybe they're, they did nothing wrong. But it seems like when we get to an asset of a large enough value, we should get notice up front just to make sure it does turn out right. Because there, as it turns out, you know, they were going to sell it for less, and I, no aspersions. You know, it's just less than what it was really worth, and that means the charitable trust has suffered a, a result unless we fix it. We can fix that better by giving notice of those sorts of things and saying, well, you know, this hospital was worth, you know, hospital probably not even, yeah, because we already have in the law dealing with hospitals, but this charitable trust park is worth this. Let's make sure that the, that the, that the charitable trust uh, purpose is protected if it goes to a for-profit status. So those are the sort of things we kind of have identified and, and then trying to provide some some more certainty so that lawyers can advise, boards can be advised well and, and, and make good informed choices. So sorry. I know I just kind of them too. So for people who are um, on online, so we have posted actually a copy of this legislation on our website, Idaho Nonprofits org and we have um, a policy tab on the top so there's two places it's really easy to find um, we are actually hopefully this morning getting the most recent version updated I sent that to our web person last night but um, it is there on the website I don't know if it's for those of you listening in um, I think what I'm hearing from John's comment and from your comment sounds like the thing to avoid is the Attorney General says to make judgment for the judgment of the board of the nonprofit, but protecting the public and the charitable assets. We, we don't want to be, we don't want to argument. We don't have the time, but we don't have the interest either. And we really, I don't even think that's the law anyways. I don't think the common law has ever said the Attorney General right. is supposed to second guess decisions of boards. It's supposed to protect assets well, for the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to the degree that you see things like, and I think waste visit, that's a good suggestion. I, I think that's more sound like micromanaging. And, and I need to take that out. We're, we're not into protecting waste. We're into protecting, you know, well, I shouldn't say it that way. No. no one wants to see waste, but it's not the Attorney General's job to call waste. It's just protecting assets. Okay. I do have another comment from um, Russell Johnson. So 4812. 
um, dash 102 uh, two in parentheses. Um, I have a charitable trust on my desk. Since you are best positioned to ensure donor intent, um, what is the donor intent of this trust? And then again, 48 dash 12 dash 102 parentheses two. Um, let's see. Oh, several times. Okay, so it's the same. Yes. Well, donors intent, you, you often, it, 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 the document, um, the, the foundational document will indicate your intent. Um, the holographic will was specific enough and um, manifested an intent. Um, that, you know, we intervened in that case and the court agreed with us. And so I said, well, there's the intent of the donor. And it's specific and it's holographic will is recognized under Idaho law. And, and so the court agreed. So then we have to implement that intent. So the intent will be, you know, the, the organic documents that the creator of the trust will typically indicate that intent. You mentioned on Idaho occurring, um, in, in what I would call the misuse of funds by some of the prior offices. I just wondered why you couldn't bring that charge. Um, we don't have any criminal authority. Now, the local prosecutor may or could it. Could it. Um, no, we, we, the Attorney General just doesn't have that sort of authority. So you have the ability to recover assets that have been Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and again, it's the goal. <clears throat> the asset has suffered a loss. Someone bought a truck. And those assets were supposed to be for marine life, you know, for educating children. and. We want to get those back to do that. So, um, so there could be, and it turned out those those gentlemen are in jail you know, anymore. I don't know if they're in jail anymore, but yeah. they were criminally yeah. prosecuted for um, for separate federal offenses um, related to. Uh, yeah, they were importing animals, not, not related not, to the misappropriation. It was related to they were importing various animals without. Yeah. Well, one of them. Yeah. So it, it, it's that. So okay. Um, as far as the the criminal aspect, we it would be great if um, boards and organizations <clears throat> informed local law enforcement of these situations when they observe misuse or misappropriation of their assets. But the problem ends up being that the organization doesn't want to go to law enforcement. Um, they don't want it to get out in the public um, for various reasons, and I totally understand that. Um, so often it's it's better to work through our office because we are able to hold the organization accountable. Um, we just want now to, to hopefully be able to hold those individuals also accountable without imposing any sort of criminal punishment on them. So, did you have anything else? Okay, so can we go to the next slide? Uh, definitions. There are a number of definitions that come directly from the Idaho Charitable Solicitations Act. They are a little bit um, modified in that they're more pared down, less wordy, but generally speaking, they're the same. Um, and that would be charitable organization, um, charitable solicitation, and I think charitable purpose um, and person. The one that is different is um, the added responsible party, and responsible party is is, the, is anyone associated with the organization, um, and that would that would that uh, term is used in the section dealing with the charitable organization and unlawful acts of misappropriation issues. Um, those would be the individuals that we would want to have authority over as a responsible party. 
But um, otherwise, there's really not much of a change here. Um, so if, if there are no questions on definitions. Oh, you're too optimistic on the questions. <laughs> the, just make a couple of observations. Uh, responsible party where it says members. I mean, I'm a member of the ARC. Uh, ICF has 500, 1,000 or more members. Um, and yeah. members to me is you've gone too far when you say members and I understand that they may have some knowledge but you know the rumors going around about an organization and the organization has I mean the YMCA has thousands of members. And let's just say that there's some rumor going around about funds are misused. In theory, you can go after you know, members of the Y that had knowledge of these rumors. And I think it's just, I did not think members was an appropriate uh, category of people to do responsible parties. No, I understand that. Um, but we have had members that no means this is appropriated charitable assets and certainly if, if they weren't the ones that did the action it wouldn't they wouldn't fall in. Maybe we can member only becomes responsible for a problem if they know only divert charitable organizations assets. So just being a member and something happens to the organization is not hold you accountable. It's under the unlawful acts um, a responsible party, if the responsible party normally uses the organization's charitable assets for private purposes. Um, so, because there have been instances where it is, it's a member, you know, and they made off with the goods um, and, and normally doing it. And, and this would allow the Attorney General to deal with that, that individual. It won't be just because you're a member of an organization and something happens at the aquarium and, and it's not saying, well, you're responsible. It has to be, we need to know that you knowingly diverted those assets, you individual member. So that's why I think maybe member works because the language over in 301 is, is I hope it's tight, tight enough. But with the aquarium, I mean, if they gave members the right to take a fish. Where do you just think that term through whether you might consider it too broad or not? Okay, okay. And then and secondly, I appreciate that. On charitable asset, um, which is subcurrent two, property will personal that a charitable organization holds for charitable purpose. And so do you view that as every single asset so that they have investment with a mutual fund? Um, is every asset being held for charitable purpose? I mean, I read that to say probably yes. And then there is a concept, and part of my focus is from a tax perspective, because that's my mention line. Um, is there's something called unrelated business income. And so there are times that a charity will sponsor something unrelated to as a fundraiser. And the, so I just get concerned about the breadth of the term charitable asset. And, and well, we did, I did think about that and I thought we limited to those assets held for a charitable purpose. Um, and but I mean, the article is, I mean, arguably every single asset can be held for charitable purpose. And that's where, you know, if you get involved in this concept of unknown business income, um, they use the receipts for charitable purpose, but the fundraiser itself might not be used for charitable purpose. So that's just my tax, my working, and just creating some concern. I think where we at least were going is let, let's 
was stupid. I didn't do this. Why didn't you have two hundred thousand dollars of land? Um, they're supposed to go help dogs. And in the interim, while that's all working out, they invested it. You know, something that earned ten percent. So by the time by the time it came to to implement it, now it's worth two hundred twenty thousand dollars. And if someone had taken that twenty thousand to go buy themselves a horse, you know, to go buy a, a ranch, we say no because those assets are part of the charitable purpose assets. Um, and so the whole two hundred twenty needs to go, and you can't take twenty that goes spend on some you know individual purpose. At least that that was the thought process. Is you know if they're connected to the charitable trust assets, then if there's growth in that, fine. If a corporation, if a nonprofit does a separate fundraiser. Um, I would think we want to try to connect that back up to the other assets with the charitable purpose at play. And I don't know if I'm answering your question well enough or not. And I'm just trying to match the words to the practical and could the words be interpreted to extend more broadly than I would do the appropriate. Okay. Well we can if you have some ideas about that would more Tighten it. We, we welcome hearing that. So that um, and all of your comments and anybody else's comments, it would be great if we could put those in writing so that we can really analyze them and go right. over right. and, and just so you know, this is like this is the last day. I mean, if, if you want to go back and study this for a couple of weeks and then write us, that's just fine too. So don't think this is your own shot. <laughs> but if there's a more, if there's a way to more tighten that, we'd mm -hmm. love to. Welcome. Actually, you're wasting it. Anyway, whatever. Okay. Did you have another one on the definitions? Or was it just looking at I think we need to keep it. Okay. Um, next slide. Charitable solicitations. And this is where we get into the meat of, of the legislation, so to speak. Um, and it is pretty much a restatement of the Idaho Charitable Solicitations Act, which as it currently exists, only it has um, consolidated some of the separate sections that are currently in the act into one section. Um, it just seems cleaner yeah. to do it that This way. is probably the one place where I don't think anything will change for us. Current law is already, this is, this is current law. It's just been moved to this new place. Now I'm full of comments, so I will make another one. Please. The, so if I go out and solicit funds for my organization, and um, as time goes on, uh, I see that the original charitable purpose doesn't fit very well. I want to change my articles to change focus a little bit of what the organization does. It can be the community has changed, it can make any number of reasons. But does that concern you as long as it's still a charitable purpose? In terms of the solicitation? So if I solicit for the organization whose purpose is to do um, protect cats, Right. And then I want to later change it to cats and dogs. No, I, um, as long as you change it to... So somebody who made a donation could say, I thought it was just going to go to cats, and that's, and I've always hated dogs, and I want to go to cats and dogs, and have I been misled? If you specifically solicit for a one, one specific purpose, um, and we have this come up all the time, where there is a fundraiser for um, to help a specific cause, and then the organization takes that money and they use it for something else. Um, and it, it could be related to their charity <coughs> purpose, but it just wasn't what they were soliciting the funds for. Then that's a violation. I think the past funds. In other words, year one. I solicit you for dogs, and I get your money, and I say, you know, I want to branch out, and I do next year dogs and cats, 
Um, I should still use year ones just for just for dogs. And I and I need to my board, you know, if I'm the board doing a RAS, say, look, these guys, this this these funds, let's make sure we just use them for for dogs. These we can do dogs or cats with this money. Um, that's how we've handled it so far. We we've not I can't remember we've had anything real formal, but when people call us, we said, look, if, if you told people it was going to be used for dogs, use that money for dogs, and maybe we'll use it all up. No, yeah, I think that's covered in that. Okay, but and we had that issue at the University of Idaho yeah. in endowments and scholarships. Uh, yeah, several years ago. Yeah, we, it's very similar. We had a judge that was first stripped on it. Yeah, than we were, right? And and that's yeah. what we dealt with with the YMCA was um, that they took the money in for sure. very specific, specific, specific projects. Yeah, it was a water park that one person gave a lot of money to develop, and there was never a water park being developed, it's not going to be developed, it went just to keep people in the It was legitimate purposes. It was the organization needed, needed to run. Needed to run. And, and so it's not like they were doing something we'd say wrong, but it's like, no, you can't do that though. If it was if, if those funds are earmarked for a identifiable purpose like a swimming pool, <coughs> you can't use it to do something else, even if you think it's a good idea. Um, because that's how we understand the law. And I'm just proposing something a little bit different, and that's when you do your fundraising, it's for the organization. And then the organization changes its articles from cats to cats and dogs versus you know, the specific oh, appeal yeah. saying... It, oh, so, for example, Brett Delaney incorporates to help cats. And I said, hey, donate to Brett Delaney. And you guys give me some money. And then year two, Red Delane says, you know, I'm going to branch out. You know, dog, cats and dogs, donate to Red Delane. Um, as long as I validly change my purposes, um, you know, the bylaws or whatever, that's less of a problem. The, the problem is when you specifically solicit for a purpose as compared to, you know, if the corporation has changed and wants to help. That's a different issue. You know? But the words to me catch that, and that's my concern. If, if the organization is, is dedicated to helping cure cancer, and it takes in donations to cure cancer, and then five years later it decides to change to curing um, no, tuberculosis. Yeah, that's a California case. That's, that's a good one. Um, then yeah, can't do that um, because the your your articles of incorporation, your bylaws, those are those can constitute um, gift instruments, and, and they say exactly what your donations coming in for are to be used for. You can't just change your charitable purpose and use those funds for something totally different. There's a California case that's on that that point. I, I suppose. In the end, it will be very specific, the answer you know, on the solicitation of the organization and on the organizational you know, creation documents of the purpose of that organization. I mean, it could be that there are instances where you want to go do cats and dogs. You now you still may need to partition the funds to, um, as long as you have those funds that are that were raised when the corporation was only going to help cats. Um, but I, I suppose it would, to some degree, depend upon the, the organizational documents, you know, how, broad they are. how broad or limited or specific they are. So I, I have a question. So when you were talking about um, restricted funding, I just kind of want to clarify. So I, I thought that, so supervision, I guess is where I can start. Supervision um, from the Attorney General's Office in regards to funds, that means there's legal consequences if the organization does not appropriate the funds that are said to appropriate them in the funding request. Is that am I making sense? Like for like there's a grant they, or something that you're yeah, like money for? Right, are there legal consequences for that? Yes. I, okay, I thought it was reputation and that's when supervision also allows the attorney general to do that. Right. Right. Um, really means. <laughs> oh, now? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Oh, right now. Um, in that, well, let's say that happened. And yeah. they notified our office that that happened. Um, we would look and see to this, what the, the scope of the harm is mm -hmm. and how was that money used? Was it used for private purposes? Was it used for another charitable purpose, a related charitable purpose? Which would be the best scenario. Um, then we would try to work with the organization to remedy that problem. Um, if it was used for private purposes, then it, it really depends, but worst case scenario, we would want that money to take back. With the YMCA case, how was the office notified? Was it the donor? Was the donor still working? It was in the newspaper. <laughs> Which is how we get a lot of our information. Um, <laughs> was it an like actual cloud on implementation? Have they never it made it just sort of alluded to something? There was never going to be a lot of that. Um, the, the person that gave all that money, they wanted the cost. Okay. And so they were making the donation specifically so for the, the Bob Jones part of that. Okay. If they weren't, if, yeah, if they had no. Perhaps they should have, but then they we didn't, have. you know, we didn't allege fraud. We, didn't, we just said you didn't do it. You didn't spend it the way it was donated. I suppose in the worst case, I mean, not worst, in, in the most strict case, the board should have said we shouldn't take this money. We're never going to build a pool. You know, if they knew that. You know, so just tell them thank you very much, or go back to the owner and say, you know, we really, just, we really need it, but we we don't have the ability to make it. So, can you work with that? You know. I, I do have, um, and as this unfolds, so what I hear you saying is under the law today that the Attorney General's office has been probably more bent towards resolution and best practices, changing best practices to achieve good fiduciary oversight and management of solicitations. With the new bill being proposed in this state seems to be shifting it from a little bit more to an add-on ability to punitive towards people in the organization who might have had oversight of the area that didn't have good best practices. So do you feel that's what I see changing the most is the people in the punitive being able to um, bring to court those individuals. Do you feel like that's going to shift the hours that you appropriate, the work that you do, and the way you appropriate it? And I have no idea in Idaho what the percentage of, is of a situation where it's ignorance or it needs to, resolution needs to come from showing up best practices to punitive for individuals. But I, I'm kind of curious because I see that as I read through this too the newest, or one of the biggest facets that's moving into I the think, um, I don't view this as punitive as much as holding people accountable. Because a, a private person should not take charitable trust assets and go buy themselves a trust. And if they do, they should be held accountable. Um, uh, the charitable trust you know, the community is the one that hurt when that happens. Um, and so I view this as less punitive, more as there is a shift that would hold individuals accountable for that sort of conduct. Now, maybe that will deter them better, and you will have less of that happening. I don't want to say it's an epidemic. It's almost virtually all the time, everything's being done right by organizations. It's not like we have a, a crisis out there. But we do have instances where people are doing this, and there isn't a, a tool in place to hold them accountable for doing that. So I view this more as an accountability tool. Um, I, it's in our interest to work with people. Um, in fact, if you look at our consumer protection cases, almost all of our cases settle. It's because we have more of an interest trying to solve a problem than, I don't know, punish is the right word. And so I would envision continuing with, you know, say this law gets passed and, and I would hope query number two shows up. Which, by the way, the current board is really on top of things. They're doing their job right. Um, and, and take a lot of steps. I, I think that you're still working with the board. 
you know, the, uh, the facts always will guide what specifically would happen, but there'd be the added tool that turned it on to hold the individuals accountable and say, that money needs to come back, and we're going to make you do it. Um, it's in our interest to try to work with people and, and, and work that out because, um, frankly, collaborative, um, amicable resolutions tend to be more long-term solutions than contentious ones. So I don't think work styles would change. Um, there would be the accountability. There, there may be some problems deterred because once we get notice, instead of having to do a lot of rushed work, we can work it out up front and so people can uh, plan accordingly. It's not like there's lots of sales going on, but to the degree there are, um, I think a notice up front would probably cut down on workloads or, or at least uh, time demands upon private parties as well as conference. So, uh, you know, at least that's my view. Um, I don't think Stephanie's workload would necessarily change or there'd be a different focus. Uh, I, I don't see that happening. So that, at least that's where we're, we're seeing how we're understanding. I see like a stronger relationship between the process and the it could be, and you know, it, it's hard to know. And, you know, it, right. private it, lawyers in, in private practice would probably know whether this would allow them to better counsel their clients or not, sure. uh, and, and and give them better. Hopefully, it, hopefully this bill would would allow them would, would allow them to say we can advise our clients better now, um, or give you better guidance. And, and lawyers, when they do their job well, or can stop problems from ever becoming problems, you know, and we never know about it. That's great, because they were able to advise their clients um, in a way that says, don't go that way, or let's do it this way, or, um, because here's what the law is. Um, so, or let me, I'll just do a quick follow-up. So, if I look at all the nonprofit corporations that are tax exempt, private secretary, state filings, a very significant percentage of them ended their articles if they've been around for 20 years. And a number of those times, the articles come in their purposes. And I don't want to be in the position as legal counsel to say, you know, you've got to go back and look at all the times that you've raised and because you've changed your purposes in some fashion, um, you've got to segregate those funds. And so that's what I want to avoid. Okay. And I think that's a fair. I understand that concern. How do you think, I mean, maybe you want to think about it. How would we fix that issue with this legislation? And I can give that further thought. Yeah, give us a thought because it's, if you think there's a... But it's kind of this misleading solicitation. Yeah. I don't want somebody to come back and say, I gave money and you amended your purposes maybe not that significant one, yeah. but we do find that there are children of people who need money who all of a sudden say, maybe I can get some of that money back, uh, and I just don't want to face that issue because I think it's empowering and appropriate. Well, we, we'll try to put some thought, but if you have some ideas on it, I can go from here. It's not necessarily just current assets, but that either. Are you raised to the judge case, raise money of two hundred thousand dollars to help cats build a facility. And five years later you change the bylaws to say dogs help cats. Now somebody said I gave money for cats for two thousand dollars. We have that happen. It's not just because it's assets. Mm -hmm. Real assets. What's, what's we probably need to think because the the flip side, and I don't, well, I don't mean flip side in the sense you, you we're, it's in all of our interests, I would think, to protect the donor's intent. Because if a donor isn't confident that the organization will carry out its intent, they won't donate. I say, you know, I'd really like to give this money because you do do cash, but I'm not confident you will carry through on it, so I'm just not going to give you the money. And, and so we have the there is a valid point, there is a valid principle of we want to protect donor intent because it will encourage donations. And on the other hand, 
you know, the tension is between that principle and the one of um, flexibility in, in terms of meeting more immediate needs, where we want to be able to, to do that as well. And, you know, where you draw that line, I, I'm not exactly, I don't seem that I know. And there are degrees. Part of the degree is, is it in the solicitation or is it in the articles themselves? Sure. And I especially want to be able to change the articles. Sure. Okay. Let, I, I got it down, you know. We, we need to move on because we're running out of time. Okay. We want to talk about it all. Um, so, charitable organizations, the next slide. Um, we have we've talked about this provision quite extensively over the course of this, um, this meeting. Um, but in general, the standard here is knowingly um, misappropriating assets or diverting them from their, the charitable organization's um, purpose. And knowingly is a legal standard. Um, it is it's knowing that you're doing it. It's not an accident. It's not by mistake. Um, and in, in our view, it would be limited to the person who is actually doing the action, although maybe that needs to be made clear based on our discussion here. Um, and just so we can, I guess, keep going um, and <laughs> save some time, if, if anybody has questions or comments about that section. That one is it's important, so please focus on that one. And I'll do it in 30 seconds. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> so 1A of 301, uh, another person's private purposes. So if I'm raising money for um, victims of a hurricane and I want to pay, you know, let's say if they were injured, I want to pay for their medical expenses, that's broad enough to cover that. That's an appropriate fund. And I need to be able to pay for private person's uh, expenses in, you know, again, hurricane benefits, whatever you want to choose. So I just think it's understanding the idea that the words are covered too much. Right. I was also concerned that literally that could be interpreted as a salary of an executive. But so it's we can move on. Um, part, part of that is um, that if, if you are soliciting for a specific person, you're not going to be necessarily holding charitable assets because you've got a specific person that is a beneficiary. This is not charitable for the public. Um, but do you have to use those those donations for that specific purpose, that person? Then yes. And that would fall in the charitable solicitation that um, rather than necessarily this collection. But I can still see how it's like a Thanks for putting that up. Um, the, the second part is the sale or transfer of charitable assets. And that covers a sale or transfer of all or substantially all of an organization's assets, um, but only if the fair market value is over $100,000. And it's more of a notice. Once again, a notice statute letting us know that this is what you intend to do um, and giving us an opportunity to intervene or object or this is this is Soldier Mountain in um, what we would like to see in practice and what we didn't get with Soldier Mountain. Very quick comment. Um, Say it's so dramatic and we're concerned about people skiing and getting hurt. So they have an like, investment account and then they've got the facility. And then they want to transfer the facility to a limited liability company to kind of protect the investment assets. So they just drop it down to a wholly owned LLC. And the and it's 
really just liability protection purposes. But that protects this, and I just don't see the need to notify the general in those sorts of circumstances. Um, it, it would be limited to instances um, that are outside the regular course of activities. And that, what you're describing right there, is in the regular course of activities. Oh, and, it's advising, I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying that. Okay. Um, and if, the, if an organization is going to continue to operate after it sells everything, or and again, that's not substantially all of its assets, but any of those, I don't know. But if it's going to continue operating, doing something else, um, then that's regular like course of activities. It wouldn't be something that would trigger this. But again, that that um, phrase, which again is a legal phrase, that regular course of activities, I have I saw when I was looking through this, and it's not addressed in the comments and that needs to be addressed. So that's a good catch there. Did you have something back? No. About 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Speed through enforcement. <laughs> um, almost everything that's in here except for a, a couple of paragraphs comes from the Idaho Consumer Protection Act. This is authority that we have under that act to enforce it. Um, the investigative authority to issue subpoenas, um, investigated demands, hold hearings, depositions, things like that. We already have that authority in the Consumer Protection Act. Quite frankly, we're unsure what extent of investigative authority we have presently under our, our general statute 6714. So we get to books. Who knows what that means? Um, so it means we get to do something. But um, we thought we'd take existing law that's already on the books and say this is what it means so that <coughs> everyone knows up front that are fighting over what it means to inspect the books. The only addition in, in Subsection 401 is routine certified fraud examiners and accountants. And do we have authority to do that already? Yes, but it helps to be specific um, and put that in there so that everybody knows that, yes, the Attorney General has authority to retain these experts to help him review records. And we, we 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 detained a forensic accountant in the Bacon County hospital case and had that individual go through thousands of line items. And uh, we retained an appraiser with Silver Mountain, for example, to you know, get, get someone who knows how to appraise serious part of the And so you know we have been doing it and we think we can, but it's better to just say there's some things we can do just so it's all clear to people. The next two sections, the voluntary compliance and the consent decree, those are different forms of settlements that we have under the Consumer Protection Act, and they seem to be the most appropriate um, vehicle for resolving instances with charities, too. Um, and the only addition to, to the statute as it exists now within the Consumer Protection Act is that the organization under the assurance statute will submit reports to the Attorney General concerning the charitable assets or charitable organization. And sometimes with for-profit entities under the Consumer Protection Act, we require them to um, report, provide annual reports to us about their activities. And this would be the same sort of thing, you know, maybe for a year or two to provide us with a financial report as to how they're using their charitable assets. And we've, we've actually done that in a couple of prior cases, and it's, it's worked out pretty well. So that we know that there's, there's no additional problems going on. Um, 
And that same provision is in the consent decree provision. And then the proceedings by the Attorney General, such as the 404. Once again, that's just a reiteration of what is in the Idaho Consumer Protection Act, except for um, sub 1, C, and D. And these are specific to charitable organizations situations. Is that the five-minute word? So, okay. It is. <laughs> um, we, we would like to um, be able to remove um, violators from from boards. Um, most of the time, they're already gone, long gone. Um, but if if the situation warrants it, um, it seems like that person should be um, no longer associated with the organization to cause more harm, or um, perhaps even. Um, involved in another nonprofit organization. And then finally, uh, D, to terminate a charitable organization liquidate its charitable assets. Of course, that would that's like the extreme um, provision when the situation has gone exponentially bad. Um, but it's there just in case. Yeah, those, those two, C and D are new don't have that under the consumer protection act. But everything else, yes. Um, service of notice, uh, violation of injunction, judgment or order, penalties and fees recovered, that's all the same as what's under the consumer protection act. Um, the uh, subsection 408, charitable assets recovered. We want to make sure that if we do we cover charitable assets that they don't just get deposited in a general account, that they are returned to the organization or um, to another organization that is similar um, to the one that was harmed if that organization is no longer operating for some reason. Um, but this would all be subject to a court, court approved order. Um, it's just important to separate from restitution penalties and charitable assets, make sure everything, all the money stuff um, goes in the right direction. So those, those are the, that's the act, basically. The next part is just changes to existing law. And I did notice an error in here. Um, under 68.12.04, section 4 down at the bottom of the page, if you go to the last page, um, uh, I think, oh, I read in, there's a summary of this act that I provided um, along with, with the legislation, I think it's posted online, and in that summary, it references um, that subsection B, paragraph B, um, would be eliminated, but that the summary should say C, not B. So B would still be there for C. So we will fix that inconsistency in the meeting. So that is that's I Kappa. Um, please, if you have any questions, comments, likes, dislikes, um, anything you want to say, anything you want to contribute, you can send it to our office uh, in in any form. Um, you can give me a call, you can give Brett a call, and we're happy to talk with you. We're happy to sit down with anybody and talk to them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, we are always available, so please reach out if you are, if you have any questions or comments. And thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Um, would it be helpful um, for us to convene another group after you have a chance to make connections or get another group? I mean, let us help bring people together for you. And then my other question is, um, since we um, travel north and east, and then I also have some facts in the north and east as the um, parents, if you guys have a, an interest in traveling, we might actually also be able to help bring some groups outside of the immediate area. 
I think both. I mean, we really, we don't pretend that we know it all, and we can find you all know a lot more than we do on a lot of things. So we really want to know what we don't know. <laughs> um, but also, you know, if you help, I, I think the legislature would respect people like you. If you were to say, we work with the Attorney General, and this is a good bill, that will probably mean a lot to them. So I, you know, I think it would it helps on that grounds too. And then I suppose, you know, a variety of people, your members will be contacting you saying, what's going on? And you can say, yeah, we're working with them, it's in, it's in good shape. But that, that helps too. So. Any questions from the There's nothing else. It's 1130. <laughs> I love it when we finish and start on time. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, I will send out any documentation that I get from Stephanie um, back to the group. So um, and I'm sure they'll stick around and just want to share a little bit. Okay. So you know us conceptually, I'm good.